In this week's episode of Studio Inter, we'll be reviewing the impressive win against Genoa. We'll be previewing the game against Hellas Verona. We'll be talking all things Inter with Gab Marcotti, this week's Moji Moratti and Frog, and much, much more. Everything on Studio Inter, on the Sempre Inter. Benvenuti, bentornati to another edition of Studio Inter, a new week. And three very impressive points, even though it's just Genoa. Uh, but before we get to everything, because there is quite a lot to talk about, uh, let me introduce my panelists, starting with the Semperinter.com preview writer, Mr. Mohamed Nassar. How are you feeling? I bet you feel like, you know, you were right all along, we need to stop being negative and, and all that stuff, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Look, I feel I feel great. I think it's uh, it couldn't have uh, possibly started on a better better note than this. Uh, but no, we'll get into it later. As the, I, I wasn't left uh, there. There are still a few questions to, that mm. need to be answered. But overall, it, it's a fantastic start. So very very happy. Absolutely, and we're also joined by a good friend from Canada. Uh, he did his who, who shares an injury history with Leonardo Spinazzola. Uh, he's a producer over on TSN. Welcome back, Mr. Michael Gallo. Well, what's going on, guys? Uh, uh, I saw Spinazzola take his first steps uh, two days ago, and I'm not even close to being there yet. So uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to, trying to look at his uh, example and uh, hopefully recover almost as quickly as he does. Forza, Michael. Forza, Michael. <laughs> Uh, and we're also joined by the Semprinter.com, uh, Semprinter.com feature writer. He writes a f- column every week called What We Learned From Inter This Week. Welcome back, Mr. Jake Smalley. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to discussing some uh, Italian football today. So, you know, it's been a long summer, hasn't it? And I've been able to get my fix a little bit while listening to the Totally Italian Football podcast with James Horncastle, James Richardson, and some man who really hates Chievo. So, you know, <laughs> Is that? Well, I'm really looking forward to talking about Inter today. It's been probably the strangest summer you can think of from a team that's just won the Scudetto. So I'm really looking forward to getting yeah. my team into some stuff. It is. It is quite bipolar. And you did write a piece where you where where that 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 got that went that got a lot, a lot, a lot of traction on the site about uh, how Sooning have made Inter into a laughing stock. Uh, but we'll, we're going to discuss all, discuss all of this with our guest. He is a senior writer on ESPN. He is one half of the Gab and Jules show um, podcast with Laurent Laurent Julien. He's also a Corriere dello Sport correspondent. He is Mr. Cal- Mr. Calcio, if you ask me, in the English speaking world, making uh, returning back to Studio Inter. Mr. Gabriel Marcotti, how are you? Thanks for having me. And uh, I just a small correction. It's uh, Julian Lawrence. Oh, Julian Lawrence. Lawrence. Sorry, Julian. sorry, he sorry. Gets, for some reason, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's your fault for having a last name that's a first name. That's what I really <laughs> well, that's, that's great, then. Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. Um, right, let's get to it. Um, before we get to the positivity, there was something that happened that I wanted to speak to you about, Gab, because I think it's pretty important. And to everyone listening, I want to give a little bit of a background story. Um, before on three days ago, four days, yeah, on the 20th of August, three days ago, uh, Inter Vice President Javier Zanetti uh, was was on an event called Campioni Sotto le Stelle. Uh, it was it, it was an event organized by the municipality of Biella, and he said some interesting things um, when he was asked about the, this season. And he says, "I cannot lie to the Inter fans. Maybe others do, but I don't." It will be a difficult and complicated season. This must be said to be fair towards everyone, but it also must be said that we will be competitive. Inzaghi is working well. Now, that in and of itself may not be something to raise one's eyebrows, but then afterwards when Gabriele Oriali left, uh, in the manner that he was left, he didn't leave, he was sacked. And Javier Zanetti went out on his Instagram page and he wrote a long letter thanking him for thanking him for everything, saying that, you know, this is always your home, etc. I see a conflict here brewing between Inter, uh, between Javier Zanetti and Suning. This is not because this is not something that he does. Javier Zanetti does not go into go go against or rock the boat at all. Here he did it two times in less than three days with a very clear message. At least that's how I interpret it. I want to ask you, Gab, what is your interpretation of this? Is there a conflict brewing? Uh, is it just uh, 
you know, he was just expressing his views? Or do you think that this was a very clear dig towards Sunni? Um, I mean, I think, I, 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 like you, I was struck by, by Sanetti's original words. Um, I, I, I think, you know, when Sanetti comes out and speaks out so clearly and, and, and doesn't cheerlead and, you know, the line about others may lie to you or whatever, I mean, misrepresent, I won't. Mm. I mean, I think, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm purely speculating here, but I was struck maybe by maybe by, by some of the stuff that, that that came out, you know, around obviously, or you guys all know, obviously the, the you know, we're under the impression that it was just going to be Hakimi, and then the offer for Lukaku comes in, and Lukaku is gone, and, and and whatever else. I think there was a sense of of perhaps promises or indications not maintained. Um, but then I also wonder about this. You know, we have a sense that these guys all sit together around one big table, but they don't. I genuinely wonder how many people at Inter actually have direct contact um, with with Sunni. How many people actually, and if so, you know, is it just with Steven or is it with decision makers at Sunni? And, and how much latitude does Steven actually have? And frankly, at this stage, how much latitude does Suning actually have? Um, because or the yeah, Zhang because, family, even or the Zhang family, because I mean, or the Zhang seen... family, yeah. I yeah. mean, I, this is, you know, we kind of have to accept that, you know, um, this inter now indirectly are essentially, you know, I don't want to say they're directly owned by the Chinese government, but that is kind of kind of the reality about influence. So. Maybe I'm partial to 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 to, to Stephen. Um, I don't think he's being deceptive. I think if certain moves are made, it's not because you know the money then flows into Stephen's pocket uh, no. or his dad's pocket. No. Um, I just think they're not really in control. They, they, this is. I think we just have to accept the fact that this is a a distressed asset and one that the Chinese government. Um, would probably like to rid itself of without making a loss, which is difficult. And and that's simply the fact. You know, sometimes clubs are under government control and it's and it's Qatar or or, or, um, or Abu Dhabi <laughs> and it's endless fun. <laughs> and other times it's a bit no, it's a bit less fun. I mean, you've essentially, you know, we've essentially been been nationalized. So I, I generally think that's all it was. I, I I'd be disappointed if. You know, Sanetti was was taking other moves. I know that there's a conspiracy theory theory whereby Sanetti was looking for other investors and positioning himself there for a post sooning future. I generally don't know. I generally get the sense that if other investors were around, um, they would have found them. Um, yeah. And I also get one other feeling when I had the opportunity, you know, back when Inter were looking to restructure their debt. Um, I know for a fact that, you know, there's somebody I know who, who works for a company that they're one of the biggest in the world at helping corporations restructure debt and have a big operation in China and whatnot. And, you know, this guy, they have offices in Milan and, you know, this guy went and, and, and he spoke to, to, to somebody at Inter and immediately the next day they set up conference calls and everything and they're all really excited to talk to him. And then, you know, when it got to China, a good trail kind of went dead. They were suddenly no longer interested. They wanted to deal with their people. They already knew what they wanted to do and how they wanted to do it. And, you know, you kind of get the sense that the people who are in charge at Inter right now have very, very little power in that regard. Mm, absolutely. I mean, speaking about that, um, like you said, I don't think this is going into Suning's pocket, any money they're making. I mean, their biggest mistake was to decline the offer from BC partners in January, February, because they got sidetracked by this waterfall called the European Super League. I think everyone is, you know, I think that's broadly accepted now. What we're in the situation they're in now is, I mean, given what we've learned from China, that Suning.com is no longer in control of the of of, of Suning. It's it's Alibaba, who essentially is run by the Chinese government. Like you said, they're not even control of the brand. They still control the 
the, the, the main company, that, the holding company that controls Inter and all other companies. But it's, it's, they, look, they look weakened. They look severely weakened and they have taken a huge loss. Um, the Zhang family, that is. Um, I personally did not believe a word when they said that they were just going to sell Hakimi. Um, I, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think that this was a situation where maybe Marotta and Auxilio were saying this in order to hope to offload the Lazaros and Joao Marios and Nainggolans and try to make up for it that way without having to sell another player? Or are, do, you, do you believe what, or are you more, do you subscribe more to the uh, events as Federico Pastorello described them in his Instagram post? Uh, look, I think <laughs> Pastorello looks out for his clients first and foremost, and he says what's in his client's interest. Uh, I don't also believe that Lukaku requested to go and all this other stuff. You know, I just simply don't believe that. Neither do um, I. I you know what really scared me about the Hakimi thing when I and I was in holidays so reading this and and was the fact that oh the club need cash and selling Hakimi is a great way to raise cash right we always hear about Plus Falain saying this and that amortized value well Hakimi doesn't bring you much in that sense yeah. because he's only been there a year right so his residual mm-hmm. value remained really high when I saw that that's when I got really concerned. Because that's when you're really, really scrambling for cash, right? Those other people, Jean Mario, Lazaro, whatever, you know, at best, what you're doing is if you can shift them, is you're getting, you know, you're getting your wages off your books and getting a couple million in. Um, if you if you saw Hakimi, you're like, right, we need cash and we need it now. Mm. You know, this is, you know, a, this is the most saleable asset, and you know, and I, and I think, and, and that, and and that is really kind of what. What blew me away? Um, Lukaku came later. I don't think Inter planned on selling him. Uh, I could be wrong here. As I said, I was on holiday. I wasn't reporting, but I genuinely got the feeling that um, you know they were thinking more. You know, let's hunker down. Let's sell. Let, let's sell somebody else. Let's you know maybe even Lautaro, um, mm. despite the fact that you know it would be more difficult because of the. Because of a contractual situation to get a big fee, and then you know when the Chelsea money came in, that so Chelsea offer came in. I have to say, and, and maybe a little old school on this, you know, very few players in the world at that age are worth that kind of money, mm-hmm. and so I think they really had no choice. I don't fault them for taking that money. Um, I think Lukaku is genuine when he says he would have loved to stay, and you know. He's happy going back to Chelsea in London. Was, that's where he spent a big chunk of formative years. That's fine. I'm, I'm good with that, too. Uh, I, I can't blame them for selling Lukaku, personally. No, 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 not blame them. But I'm thinking more in the sense that, you know, he wrote, you know, he was very clear. For me, the most import, important and, and interesting part of what Pastorella said was, you know, Simone Inzaghi, which I believe, uh, and then Beppe Marotta and Piero Auxilio did not want to sell Lukaku. It was the Chinese ownership who decided to make some evaluations. Um, that That's the version of events that I find really interesting. Well, because, look, uh, I mean, I, you want me to be really cynical here? I'm Italian. I can be as cynical as the next guy, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just asking. Pastorello after what is more think. likely to do business with Marotta and D'Azilio <laughs> at some point in the future <laughs> than he is to go and do business with Suning or indeed with the Chinese government, right? Um, yeah. And look, I, I think at this point, at this point too, I mean, look, uh, if the scenario is what we were saying earlier, that they're just sitting around waiting for better times to sell the club, um, you know, if you're the Jang family, yeah, okay, we'll play the bad guys, we'll take it on the chin, you know, sure, blame us, right? I, it would be, it would, it would have made no sense for Stephen Jang to come out and be like, oh no, I wanted to keep Lukaku, but you know. That bad Mr. Marotta decided to sell him. <laughs> I, well, what are you going to do? Like you're undermining your guy, and you're undermining the club, and um, you're making his job tougher when he works for you and it's yeah. your asset. You know, I I get all that. I, I don't think anybody wanted to sell Lukaku, but when somebody puts that much money on the table and you're in that financial situation, that's what you have to do. Yeah, that's true. I'm going to hand you over to Mo. Mo, did you have a question for Gab? 
Yeah, uh, I have a I have a question. I forgot, but I just wanted to comment on uh, on on this. I, I don't know uh, where, where uh, Lukaku said that he wanted to stay other than through Pastorello. It's all uh, it's a dream come true, kissing the Chelsea badge. I think Lukaku is very happy to go. I I, I don't see for a second. I, I, I haven't seen any compelling evidence to, to and I don't dislike Lukaku for leaving. I don't label him a traitor. It's fine. He's done great for us, like we said last week, so on and so forth. But I'm under no illusions that Lukaku wanted to leave. He, he, he figures that Chelsea is a bigger team. They just won the Champions League. He'd like to get the European, get the European trophy under his belt after winning the league. And he decided that the, it's greener pastures back in London. And that's why he's off. Uh, I, especially since Conte had left, so uh, I, I, I think Lukaku is is the main person who did want to leave. I think, uh, like uh, Gab had just said, uh, potentially they would have been uh, Marotta and Auxilio would have been uh, content in uh, in offloading uh, Lautaro. As we know, they had already received an offer from Tottenham. They they would have been very content in uh, in, in letting go of Lautaro, who probably has a bit more. Uh, capital gain and less of a residual value on the books anyway. So it would have made both financial and technical sense, perhaps, to get rid of him. But anyway, I don't want to get sidetracked on that. My question to you, uh, Gab, is uh, looking back, if you could, uh, 12 months ago, or maybe uh, just over 12 months, however long last season was, um, looking at, you know, comparing where you stand today and looking at the inter- interest prospects in, in the league, are you more or less optimistic about their chances than you were last season at the same time? Um, I, I, I'm less optimistic. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was a Conte critic as much as anybody. Mm. Um, but equally, and, and, you know, I'm repeating myself, I said this on the show as well, but um, Conte, especially Conte in his second season, is going to be better, is, is just a better outlook, a better prospect, a better, more value, I think, more likely to succeed than Simone Inzaghi in his first season. Um, Lukaku, I think, is just a better player and a better bet than than Dzeko, simply because of Dzeko's age. I know it's a different thing, and Dzeko takes care of himself, and, you know, he's like the playmaking center forward. Yeah, but, you know, he's also 35 years old. Um, and people at that age start getting injured, and he made he started what 20 games last season in Serie A. Um, Hakimi and Dumfries, I, I don't even want to go there. I, <laughs> I hope Dumfries as well, but for me, Hakimi is one of the best players in the world, um, in his position. And I don't like Shalanoglu, um, nothing personal, he had a fantastic debut, but I thought he tailed off really badly, uh, in the last six months at Milan. Um, and you know, when I compare what he brings with what Ericsson, with all his limitations and everything, could have brought. And obviously, Ericsson's nobody's fault, and who knows, maybe he will come back. Although, I, I'd be really surprised if he does. Yeah, um, you know, to me, those are four downgrades, and you know, certainly when it comes to Hakimi and Lukaku, I don't know what you guys think about it. I think we're talking about two of maybe the three best players at Inter who've mm-hmm. been replaced, the third one, in my opinion, being Barella, who've been replaced by guys who aren't on the same level. Um, and Jekyll will never be on the same level because Jekyll's not going to get better. He's going to get worse. So when I look at that, I, I think the prospects have to be worse um, for, for Inter this season than they were going into last season. Yeah, that, that's that's. I mean, it's that's unmistakable. I think I don't think we can anyone can d- deny that Inter are on paper weaker side, uh, regardless of how we you know how we say it. But I do think there's an aspect, and I wanted to ask you about this as well. And that is that I think Romelu Lukaku is not the kind of striker that I think suits Simone that well. He likes the Chiro Immobiles. He likes to have the only time he ever played Caicedo was towards the, you know, when, when he was throwing the kitchen sink when he was chasing the game. Uh, and Murici, he was, he was given uh, to, put, uh, to put it diplomatically. I think that losing Lukaku is not the, the BL, like it's not such a disaster for how Simone Inzaghi likes to play. But I agree with you on the, on, on, on the Christian Eriks and Chalanoglu, which was not anyone's fault. 
um, because now he's missing a number 10 and he's bringing, he wants to bring in Korea. So I, I mean, it's, it's going to be different. And as for Simone Inzaghi versus Conte, there's no discussion who's, who's won more and who, but who, but he, you know, and who's, who, but, but he's also been a coach longer at this level. Simone is pretty much at the infancy of his coaching career. I've been his biggest fan, you know that. Uh, I think he's the next Italian super coach after Conte. And I've thought this for four years. I still think that he. I, I think the, he's also proven that in 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 incredibly difficult circumstances he can handle himself better. So therefore, I I think that Inter actually have a better chance, even though they have had a horrible summer. And I agree with everything you said in terms of the weaknesses. Yeah, look, if you want to find a silver lining, and I, I was talking to an Italian assistant coach about this. Uh, I was actually working in a different club right now in Serie A. And he said, you know what? Conte wears people down. People get tired of his mm. message and the shouting and whatever. <laughs> so it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing in normal circumstances, in different circumstances, to, you know, just sort of transition from that to somebody who's a little more human. <laughs> uh, like Simone Inzaghi. Uh, so I get that side of things. I'm not 100% with you about, you know, Inzaghi likes the Immobile striker, whatever. We know he did well with the Immobile type striker. And also, I, I can't believe you mentioned uh, Morici and Caicedo in the same breath as Lukaku. <laughs> Um, no, no. I mean that he uses but, uh, those type of strikers when he wants to throw the okay. throw the but kitchen you, sink. No, I get it. But if you want to go there, like he never had a Jekyll type striker either, right? No, no. And now he's going to need to work with one, right? Um, again, for me, uh, like if you can get Correa on the cheap, sure, fine. It's a, it's, it's another body. Um, I think. I, the the the, the Turam thing, I thought was odd, not because Turam is a bad signing, and I like the fact that oh look, Inter signing somebody younger, whatever else. It's just mm-hmm. that, you know, you're signing him on Rayola terms, so you have no idea where that's gonna where that's going or where that's gonna take you. <laughs> um, plus, the other thing about him is he played a lot as a winger in a yeah. three. So yeah, I'm sure he can be on the front too. But I, I don't know. I maybe I'm old fashioned this way. I think for most clubs, it helps if you have a clear hierarchy. Yeah. So if we go into the season saying, all right, Jekyll and Lautaro are two, you know, first choice strikers. Alexis, since we can't sell him, comes off the bench. And then we have, you know, Pinamonti if we need to go and, bat- and butt heads or whatever, right? Um, I'm good with that. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. If you also need Correa to play a little behind, give you something different or... You know, we saw Stefano Sensi making those mm. runs. Fine. Um, let's give it a go. But but I I would hate to see to then now all of a sudden, you know, take the Lukaku money and kind of invest in air quotes in getting other people's, you know, what look like other people's cheap cast offs, and then you get stuck into into these big contracts that Inter mm. can never get rid of, which <laughs> Inter certainly have a history of. Oh yes. <laughs> I'm gonna hand you over to Mike. As I uh, watch Alessandro Florenzi warm up for Milan, which is kind of an odd sight right now, um, my question kind of deals with the same type of thing we we're just talking about. If things stay status quo for Inter and they don't make any other moves on the transfer market, um, do you see, like we didn't get to see it in the first game because Lotaro was suspended. So, But going forward, do you, do you see Lotaro and Jekyll you know, starting for Inter together or do you see them more as an interchangeable type Striker, like, what do you see Inzaghi doing up top if things stay status quo? Um, I would expect them to start together. I hope they start together. And, and it makes sense, right? You, we've got Checo on the set pieces. Checo can drop off. He can certainly pass. Lukaku, uh, sorry, Lautaro. Um, Lukaku, there you go. Uh, Lautaro, if only. Lautaro runs behind. Um, I think you can do a lot, you know, with the two of them. Um, we, we've seen lots that are used in different roles um, uh, and, and and play with different types of strikers. Um, and I think he has that versatility in him. And you know, once he signed his contract, he's gonna he's he's gonna be hopefully you know more calm and more focused, and and he can he can show his value. Um, I don't I don't have an issue with 
with the, with a Jekyll out power front too. And I think if it means that because I don't expect Jekyll to play every game, if it means that then in certain games, you know, we throw a different look and maybe it's more counterattacking, maybe with Sancy in behind, or, or 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 maybe you know it's it's Alexis and it's more the counter. That's fine too. Um, but I I don't want to see you know I, I I look at it if we're committing big resources in terms of wages to Lautaro and Jekyll, then and and both you know one of them's new, the other one signs a new contract, then those are the people who who should play. Those are the people we should be getting on the pitch. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Jake. Yeah, I've got a bit of an interesting question for you. Um, when Conte was appointed into manager, you're very much against it. Um, you you bit turned out to be a bit of a mystic Meg on that one, and um, proven very correct. So I just wanted to ask you a bit about Simone Inzaghi. Do you think he's a manager who can actually win the Scudetto for Inter? I know he's being discussed a little bit, but is he got it in him to replicate what Conte has done, albeit in more difficult circumstances? So I don't think Inter are by any means favourites um, for the title. I think I had them finishing fourth in my preseason um, predictions. But again, that comes with the big caveat that this is Italy and it's stupid to make predictions now when the mercato is open until August 31st and so many things uh, can change. Um Simone Inzaghi's, I, I think, is a really difficult one. Um, I know Juve took a really long, hard look at him. Uh, and part of the reason, from what I was told, um, that they didn't go for him, this is when they, when Allegri left and they pointed Sarri, is that, you know, they saw he was a bit soft. He was a bit wimpy, a bit of a mama's boy. <laughs> and I, I think that simply has to do with the way he looked. Frankly, right, uh, and I think you know in the same way people thought Ancelotti was soft. You know, uh, it's the same. In fact, the person I spoke to said the exact same thing. Right, this is the same stuff that they said about Ancelotti when he came to Juve. You know, uh, he's got the bonaccione kind of look, as we say in Italy, and so on. And and I think in some ways, most successful managers in Italy, probably in Europe. I work with me now because I'm just <laughs> came in my mind. Either they're like hard asses, you know, and obviously you know the the the, the type, the Conte, Mourinho, whatever, or they're cerebral, right? I I put Tuchel in there, I put Guardiola in there. Um, Allegri comes in kind of hard between, but Allegri can be really snarky and cutting as well, right? So like he's not a traditional hard ass, perhaps, but you know he's got that edge about him. Um, Simone Inzaghi doesn't really fit either category. He's just a guy that goes out, coaches his team, um, gets them to play together. Uh, one thing at Lazio that, that I was told from, you know, when he was there was he, even though he had a lot of player because it's 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 Lotito and it's the market and it's Puccioli into this and that, he really only trusted the same sort of 13, 14 guys. Um, and, and, and that was a criticism um, of him. Uh, other players don't necessarily feel as involved. I think that's something he's going to have to change uh, a little bit at Inter. Um, but I think if he can command the respect, and you know, I think his achievements at Lazio suggest that he deserves respect, um, then I think Inter can be competitive. I don't know that it's going to happen in the first season, though, because you know his football is very different from Conte's, and his style is very different from Conte's. Yeah, I mean, it's much more direct and much more vertical than, uh, sorry, horizontal in that sense than, than Conte's vertical and, and very rigidly controlled and methodical football, for sure. Um, I and, and I can just echo that after two years of Luciano Spalletti and Antonio Conte, I feel very good and very happy that an actual sane human being that speaks in complete exactly. sentences that that isn't a mouth breather is now in charge of Inter. Um, <laughs> That, that, that whose sentences have a, a a start, a middle, and an end, and a point to them. Uh, I'm very happy about that. It's a nice break from the four years of crazy that we've had. Um, but uh, before that was a nice segue. I want to ask you about your um, your top four, or actually your top six, because the European places. Um, who do you have from one to six? Okay, I I, I know. I'm I'm with this. you. The I'm with windows you. open. I'm with but you. I'm I, with you. I don't know. I, I generally don't know. I mean, I think 
I picked Juve to win, maybe for the simple reason that, you know, for all nine years that they won it, I picked them to win every, sorry, I picked against them every year and they always won. <laughs> Um, so I picked them last year and they didn't, so I decided to pick them again. Um, <laughs> I love uh, it. but no, but I mean, like, objectively, this is a really, really good team, you know. Um, and I think Allegri has what it takes. I think for me, the really interesting one is is Milan. As I recall, I had Milan finishing second. Um, and I think you know, it was it was more to do. With the fact that I, I think a lot of the a lot of their kids are going to come good, and I think they're going to continue to grow. Um, I think they have some really really smart people making personnel decisions. Some of them I don't like. Uh, like obviously the I, I I would have given Ibrahimovic you know a freaking pay for play. I mean like you love the club so much, fine you know we'll pay you a hundred grand every time you step on the pitch and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that, you know, honestly, like, but I, I'm really happy and I'm, I'm even a little bit proud of the fact that, you know, I know this is a total aside that they stood up to Donnarumma and to Shalanoglu, you know, yeah. Yeah, um, agreed. Agreed. it's about time people do that, you know, people crying, we don't have any money, the Super League, well, yeah, don't give these people and these agents enormous salaries, you know, remember who's in charge and you're not going to have this problem. So, um, so I think I had them finishing second, and I believe I had. I'm blanking now. Um, I, I really like Atalanta. Mm. Um, I kind of feel that Romero is somebody that they can absorb, and I really like the the kid from Verona that they brought in. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know if he's going to play right away, but you know they like to ease guys in. Um, I think Piccoli. I'm not saying this because he scored at the weekend, but. Um, I thought Piccoli was a huge part of Spitz this season last year. He's only 20 years old. He gives him another body, even if if, if Duvan Zapata goes. Um, so I really like Atalanta. I think they can finish top four. I think Inter, I think I had Inter fourth. Um, although, having watched, you know, after this weekend, I remind myself, man, Spalletti has a lot of really good players. Yeah. Um, like, I said last year that it's probably the best squad in Serie A. In terms of talent, on paper, um, yeah, on paper, and yeah, uh, the question is: At what point does Spalletti start to self-destruct, right? Um, uh, and also, I think the Insignia thing weighs weighs heavily as well. I don't love Insignia as much as some people do, um, but obviously he's important there. Um, and then, and then finally, your old pal Mourinho, mm. man, Zaniolo's there. Uh, mm. I was super skeptical about making the transition from Fonseca to kind of like the anti Fonseca and Mourinho, but you know, Zaniolo is pretty huge coming back, you know, mm. uh, like that. And I really like the Tammy Abraham signing as well. So I love Shamuro though. I think he's like if you were to like breed a Mourinho striker, perfect for Mourinho, it'd be Shamuro though. Like he's, I think he's ideal for his football. Yeah, he's a really, really good fit as well. So, you know, you put those things together and, you know, they're going to be competitive too. I, I think Inter should be a notch above those other those other teams. And I think Inter should be competing, um, you know, in the top three. Uh, but I don't know. I, I feel like all these people have the levels to go to. I mean, yeah. I love Osimhen, right? Who's to say this isn't Osimhen's breakout season? He doesn't yeah. score 30 goals. You know, he's got people setting him up. Long he doesn't get himself sent off, but it wasn't even his fault at the weekend, by the way. You know, come on, Gab, he punched someone, he slapped someone in the face. Come on, man. <laughs> come on, Gab, yeah, you can't but... slap people in the face. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it was like, I, I, of all the red cards that, that we had that weekend, I thought that was the clearest. Don't you agree? I mean, <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I got the 20 minutes. The guy's pulling him. <laughs> that is it. Oh, God. Uh, but, I mean, just quickly, um, who do you think will win Supercoppa? Do you think, uh, uh, and also Coppa Italia, and, and, and who's your uh, capo canoniere? Um, I think I'd shoot a Mobile as capo canoniere. Um, and that was because I obviously didn't want to pick the Portuguese man in, uh, from Turin because he might not be there. I sort of looked around and I said, how many games is Zebra going to play? Okay, not many. 
Lukaku's gone, so hmm. he, he seemed like he seemed like the obvious choice, right? He's scoring so <laughs> many goals. I, there's you know, not much science in that one. No. Um, yeah, I Copa Italia, Super Copa, man. I I don't know. I I, I can't provide predictive value on those because yeah. knockout competitions over the course of the season, so many other factors. Yeah. Um, I do hope you do not win the Copa Italia, so that you know we don't come up. In fact, that's the thing that bugs me. It's like it's a very Italian thing when, like, you know, they come out and they say things like, "Oh, but, oh, but you were still won the the Super Copa and the Coppa Italia, do a trophy." I'm like, "Stop it with the Super Copa! Come on, man. <laughs> let's grow up. That's not a trophy. It's one game. It's not the same. <laughs> you know, seriously, no. It's it's, it's like when Milan had the Trofeo Berlusconi, and they started <laughs> counting it. You know, yeah, that the Gamper, the Bernabeu, yeah, count all of them." Copa del Nonno, come on, man. <laughs> Copa del Nonno. <laughs> love, it, love it, love it. My, fr- hey, my friends like to call them the Mickey Mouse trophies of the league. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's worse than Mickey Mouse. It's like one of those, and I, and I say this as a Disney employee, it's not Mickey Mouse. It's those, like, knockoffs, like, you know, Dickie Douse or something that, you know, you might find on a street corner that, you know, are, like, made somewhere in a sweatshop by children for children. It's like that. Like, honestly. <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> Absolutely love it. I mean, I don't uh, want to say nobody cares. Coppa Italia, you get to the quarterfinals, head to head. Yeah. I, I, I really enjoy watching it. I enjoy watching Coppa Italia more now than before because because it's fun. Big teams facing each other and, you know, they know 90 minutes a year or, 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 or it's head to head and it's all over, right? Yeah. Um, But the Super Coppa, seriously, you know. It's, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's. I can a, do without. Yeah, I mean, I think it should be what they've intended it to be. It should st- kick off this. It's a start the season with a game. It's not the most important trophy. It's just a game, like you said. But the way that they've done it now, and they've got it like mid-season, and they put it in Saudi Arabia. I understand the financial reasons they do that, but I think it kind of ruins the point a little bit. I mean, I like the fact that Coppa Italia is how is the season ends. I'd like the Super Copa to start the kick kick off the season. I think that that's like you know. Well, it- if I can make a point about Saudi Arabia as well and holding it there, I'd love somebody in the media with access to the people who decide to put it there to say, OK, are you having in Saudi Arabia just because they cut you a big check? Or is this part of a concerted campaign in the Gulf to create sponsorships and partnerships and whatever else and things that will bring revenue to the league and grow the game in, in that part of the world? And if so, what are the KPIs and how far along are you to reaching your target? I'd love somebody to say that because from where I sit, it just seems like, oh, you know, some rich guy in Saudi Arabia just cut you a big check and that's it. And let's go and have a jolly there, you know, as much as you can have one in Saudi. I, but, so but if you see what I'm saying? If it's yeah, part of a concerted campaign, yeah. and, and I think the Lego City has done a lot of things better than, than they did in the past, but, and I know this is obviously a situation they inherited and Goodness knows, it's better than. Remember the year they had it in China? Yeah. And it looked like the camera work was like, you know, some guy in like a handy cam from the 1980s or something filming it. I, I don't want to see that again. But still. No. No, no I, I hear you. I agree with you on that. But then again, I, I think it's the Lega Calcio and, and them having a strategy is, is, is yeah, I, I don't I don't have that. Maybe I'm too cynical there. I don't I don't have any faith in them having that. I think the TV deal and, and how that's been mishandled this year and going into this season, uh, not just in Italy, but outside of Italy, the way that it is in Canada, it's in, in, the, in the Middle East. They don't even have this showing five games a week in Middle East, North Africa region uh, because of what they did with be in and be out and that whole mess. Um, well, even and- in, I, I've had, I don't know if this is true, but I've had people on my feed, you know, from Australia saying like, well, they haven't assigned the rights, mm-hmm. you know. France doesn't uh, have I, one either. I believe a few years ago, Syria actually did something innovative and in those um, territories, uh, and I, you know, I don't want to bore people with this, but I know you get listeners from all over the world. In those territories where the rights weren't assigned, um, you could essentially, on a geolocation basis, you could essentially buy the package directly from City A, yeah. and you would get the world feed, right? I yeah. forget what it was called. Like, um, And that's the way they should do it. If you can't sell the rights, just freaking do it that way. Get some money in. It's not, it's not like the, the marginal cost of doing it is tiny, right? So. Yeah. Uh, but but at least you can reach people and 
All right, so they get the world feed comment. Some of those world feed commentaries are terrible. Some of them are okay, but but at least you got something, right? Yeah. Um, I I don't I, I don't understand why why they don't do that. No, but for me, I'm I'm a big fan of the CVC Bain Capital deal. I think that's the way for Serie A to move forward in order to have any shot of competing with the Premier League, creating a media company, selling off 10%, which gives you cash, and then they take care of monetizing and pushing this globally. I think that's the way to go. I think it's the only way that the Serie A and La Liga will be able to compete with the Premier League in terms of TV revenue. I know what you think about you that. You know, it's it's funny because so the whole issue with that is, I mean, from the beginning, I had the opportunity to speak to one ownership group that I know pretty well. They were big proponents, and then I spoke to another ownership group. Uh, well, I can tell you where it is because I interviewed him. It's Rocco Comiso mm. at Fiorentina, who was dead set against it. And I think one of the so the. the what was his reasons for being against it? Well, this though? is the thing. There, there, there were two key things to make it happen, right? One was no more Lotito, right? Lotito, the, commi- the de facto commissioner of Serie A, no more, right? Mm. Grown-ups in the room making the, making the decisions. And, and unfortunately, even then, you saw with the fact that, hey, look, Salernitana are in Serie A, that unfortunately getting rid of Lotito is like, like getting rid of that, that horrible rash that never goes away, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know what they have to know, but it's 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 a, we we joke about this, but he is part of the reason. Yeah. Um, people don't want to invest in Serie A, or people increasingly are, but I, but he scares people away, right? Um, but at least he's been he's been slightly neutered, right? Right now mm-hmm. he's not the power broker he once was, so any time notwithstanding. Um, but the other big reason was, okay, so these guys come in. They pay a, a large amount of money, and they have ten percent control. Yeah. When you have minority control like that, you get this thing called, which is called negative control. Mm. Essentially, you get the power. You have certain powers that go far beyond your shareholding, and uh, where you can veto certain things, you can you can control certain aspects. And that was really what the argument was all about. It's actually it's a pretty sophisticated structure to put in place. It takes uh, it takes a good amount of faith, and you know, to hear Rocco talk about it, um, essentially, they were essentially giving the city out product away, um, because in his opinion, in a couple years there there will be better governance of city out, and they can make a lot more money without having. Um, the funds in in their business, right? That was his mm. view. Yeah. The other people I spoke to said that's ridiculous. The only way we can run this properly is if you know we have I don't want to say grown ups, but we have this external party that we're accountable to that um, is going to force us to be transparent, is going to force us to have better governance. But the only way exactly. that we do that is if we give them that what's called negative control. If we give them that ability to almost like a golden share so that we as a league don't make decisions that are not transparent that are going to scare investors away decisions for political reasons and so on and i think that was that was essentially the crux of the issue um in city a which made it a bit different than for example what happened in la liga where fundamentally it is you know barcelona and real madrid not liking javier tebas and not trusting javier tebas and wanting to hold on to their pie in Italy, there was a much more collaborative ethos, and that's why you see there's there were big clubs in favor and big clubs against it. Mm. No, I agree, I agree. But I mean, I think that point that Rocco made. I mean, that's a negotiating point. You can, I mean, the negative control thing that you can you can limit that with clauses as to what areas they can get involved in and whatnot. Um, and and I think the the only way for this league to grow is for a external company specialized in monetizing. Um, and 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 pushing this uh, globally uh, is is the only way forward. Because as long as you're going to have this situation where you have where Preziosi and all these guys are going to sit. Ferreira there. was on my screen a second ago as you were talking. And yeah. Like, oh, there you go. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there, you know, there you go. I mean, as long as these people have to, you know, rubber stamp everything, this league ain't going anywhere. <laughs> it's yeah. just as simple I, as that. I, I I'm still marginally optimistic going forward i always i always play the game where you know 
I can't. Okay, so how many of the city uh, presidents or owners have criminal records? <laughs> and, no, honestly, like I know. <laughs> I, if, you, if, if, if you go back like 50 years ago, it was more than half. Yeah. You know, and some of them were disputed, like 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 Berlusconi and yeah. and uh, the, the the guy in Cagliari and whatever. But you know, right now, you ask yourself, you know, how many? I or, or put this test, like you know, who? How many of these guys would I take advice from to do <laughs> something legal? You know, mm -hmm. and you know the fact that. Okay, uh, I I still have my 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 top three freak shows, but then you know I look at it and like I don't particularly like Urbano Cairo, but you know he's all right. He's a businessman. He kind of yeah. does his things. Most of these American owners seem to be in it for a buck, and they run their businesses like a business. Rocco, admittedly, is is slightly different, but you know you can deal with it. I think Inter at some point will end up in good hands because the club is too strong, the history is too strong, the brand is too strong, and and I think they have done some good things um, in the last couple of years. Um, so you know, little by little, you get a little more positive, and you know, and unfortunately, then you realize Lotito owns two clubs, so then you know he's he's in the top three twice, you know, <laughs> with 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 Ferrero and and uh, and, and Preziosi, unfortunately, but yeah, both okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Kevin. Get. Yeah, exactly. Thank hey, you so much pleasure. for coming up. Before before we let you go, uh, people, it's at Marcotti on Twitter, and also if you if you got something coming on that uh, you know coming up because you you know I love your Monday musings, and also if you guys you got something else coming on, the floor is yours. Feel free to promote it. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, if, uh, if you need a, a quick rundown, quick opinionated rundown of what's going on in Europe twice a week, uh, the Gab and Jewel show is a good. Protocol, if I say so myself, it's, it's it a is. podcast. You can get it where you get your podcasts. Uh, we also have little videos that go up on uh, on the uh, ESPN um, uh, YouTube channel. Um, we're, we we hope to be doing something a little different this year as well, adding sort of some podcast specials um, where you know we have conversations with with people in the game, hopefully really famous people, and maybe also some people who are not famous but are important. Mm -hmm. um, so look out for that and um uh yeah and uh the columns up a couple times a week and you can always generally always hit me up on uh, on twitter and if i have time I'm always happy to answer thank you so much Kev. it's always a pleasure to have you on thank you so much for taking the time it's my pleasure voice thanks for having me on and uh, and, and, and keep the faith <laughs> definitely ci sentiamo ciao alla grande ciao Right. Um, let's uh, let's move on to uh, the game against Genoa, which was absolutely a fantastic game for, from Inter's point of view in every sense of the word, because it was maybe for a lot of people, it was a surprise to see Inter play like that. But I'm not surprised because this is how Simone Inzaghi's Lazio looked like when they were at their peak. They dominated possession. They pressed high up. Um, they were sometimes a little bit uh, over too uh, attacking and, and sometimes lost uh, balance and therefore were a little bit exposed as we saw against Genoa at times but this is how it looks it's much more direct it's much more horizontal and it's uh, much more position and uh, much more attacking if you want to call it that way um, I, I'm, I want to hear what you think uh, Mike uh, your your first your, your reactions to uh, to you know what, what were you surprised by what, what you saw and 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 how, you know what do you think this means going forward well, uh, my, my first thought was, when did Bastoni become a Turquartista? Uh, he was playing, <laughs> he was playing like, like, a, like a forward at some points, and not even just because it was a corner, but like he was, and it comes back to what you just said, you know, playing such a high press. He was even playing defense at some, some points. It was like he was in the midfield, he was playing attacking, and that was, I think that's something that we just maybe wouldn't see under Conte, and that's what I really liked yesterday. I know it had a lot to, lot to do with... Um, Genoa not being that great of a team, but um, I love that. I love that how you know different positions were playing, different players were playing different positions, on, on, and keep the opponents guessing. That's what I really liked. Um, I mean, I look at every individual player uh, in the game, and it was like every single player. I think with the exception, with the exception of maybe Sensi, I really liked. Yeah. I really liked. Um, I think we got exactly uh, what we expected out of Jekyll. Uh, he was he was great. The way he controls the ball is what is what the, the he's the player that we saw at Roma 
Um, you know, he's going to get his chances. He's, he's going to miss a lot, but he's also going to, going to take care of them. Um, I really love, I mean, that assist from Barella was probably just out of this world to, to have the, the, you know, the, the, the genes just to decide to do that. Mm. Um, but I, but I really, but I really like uh, just the formation and 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 how everyone played together as a team. And I just, uh, I love to see Lautaro in this, in this, uh, in this lineup. Um, again, a lot of people are saying that, oh, it's Genoa. Relax, it's Genoa. But uh, I liked it. And and Hakan, like I, I didn't expect that at all, especially with all the with all the uh, the garbage that Milan fans were saying in the last uh, couple of months and how and then you know he didn't have a really good Euros, but. I thought he was excellent. He was in on what three of the goals, and uh, I I like to start. Hey, it's just Genoa, but let's uh, let's you know move on to the next week, and hopefully we can get another three points, right? Yeah. Um, for me, this was this this echoed a lot of what we saw the first game under Antonio Conte, four uh, 0 against Lecce, uh, but with a difference that that Inter was an Inter who was, you know, brimming with confidence be, and, and aiming higher and world domination, whilst this is an Inter coming from a summer that has been weakened, at least on paper and in every in every change they've made. But that's why I was so impressed by this win, because the, the mentality, they came out as champions, they behaved like champions. And above all, when you see Arturo Vidal play the way he did, that tells me that this is a team that is that is behind Simone Inzaghi. They want to win, they're concentrated. And that, and, and he said as much that it's made his life easier. It's made his job easier. I'm keen to hear. I mean, you, you, you know, Mo, you have Inter winning the Serie A. Um, what, what, what were you? What's your takeaways from this game? Yeah, look, nothing uh, changed my mind, uh, positively or negatively. I think uh, uh, they, they played the way, the same way they did in the preseason. I think. Uh, the, the, the various uh, attacking, uh, uh, how do you call them, like uh, sentences, uh, plays between the different, uh, between the link up between the midfield and the, and the attackers in the final third was very impressive. Uh, the fluidity in moving the ball uh, was very nice. Uh, but again, I, I think we're going to win the league not because uh, we've improved, which we might, we might do. I mean, you know, uh, Gav again said that maybe it's Ossiman's breakout season, but, you know, it could be Dumfries' uh, breakout season. It could be whoever's breakout season. So we, we, we don't know. But I, I, think, uh, I think that we're going to win the league because we're, we're still, no, no other side has, it seems like it's been able to bridge the gap between Inter and, uh, between them and, and, and the champions more than anything. So I think uh, what we saw from the, from the remaining performances, uh, whether it's Atalanta, who did manage to win, or Lazio, who also did manage to win, uh, or Juventus, of course, who drew, and uh, Milan against Sampdoria are playing right now. I think this, for me, is, is, is what really cemented uh, my, my, my prediction in that uh, we're going to win the league at the end of the, at the, end of the season. What, what got me a bit worried was at the beginning of the second half, the way that Genoa were able to, to reach uh, into his final third uh, uh, quite easily. Not that they had chances, but I think, you know, we spoke about Conte's Cateveria and, and the fact that, you know, uh, again, Gab was saying that uh, Inzaghi is a bit of a, 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 bit of a, a whiny mama's boy in, in Juventus' eyes, and that's why they didn't take him. So I think... Uh, maybe this is the the one point in in our play where we we might suffer is that we it doesn't seem like the players have the same sort of um, uh, killer instinct to eliminate uh, attacks by the opponents at the bud. So uh, while of course there were no real substantial threats on on the inter goal, I, I felt like they allowed Genoa some towards the beginning of the se uh, second half, some control in the middle third and in, in towards Inter's final third, uh, defensive third, that would not have been normally afforded by Conte. You would have probably seen Conte on the sidelines screaming and shouting and, and you know, uh, going crazy, where Inzaghi seemed a bit more resigned. And I don't know if this is an intentional, an intentional sort of uh, uh, tactical decision by Inzaghi. He knows that 
he can't pressure the players, this is the way that he controls the game, it's part of his overall plan, or whether this is a character flaw and we might find ourselves suffering against bigger teams who, who do have that bite, uh, or, or more of a bite than, than certainly than, than Genoa do. So this mm. was my, my only point of concern, was, was that, that sense of midfield uh, cynical control. You know, like there, there seemed to be this, uh, there seemed to, they seem to be lacking this sort of uh, uh, cynical control in, 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 in the central uh, midfield, or if only for a portion of, of, of the match, because they, they had dominated the rest of the game almost from start to finish. But that's that's my only asterisk on the performance. I, I agree with that. I, I think we, we saw that also in the chances conceded uh, defensively. And I think that's something that that, that he addressed by bringing on Vecino and, and, and Vidal, so which which encouraged me. Um, Jake, uh, just before we, we quickly move on to the Hellas game to quickly predict, because Hellas are awful and they're coached by probably the worst coach to have coached in the Serie A in the last decade, um, just quickly, give me your your thoughts uh, on 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 what you take away from from the uh, Genoa game. Uh, I want to echo what you said. Really, I think the most encouraging part is simply the fact that Inter responded so well, albeit on match day one against fairly weak opposition to what's been a really tough summer. I think the players really showed that they're behind Inzaghi. I think as well, what's easy to forget, you talk about Lukaku and Hakimi leaving. Yeah, the two big massive players for Inter, but. You've still got some really excellent players in there. Players like Milan Skriniar, you've got Barella. I know it goes without saying, but another thing as well that's been mentioned there uh, by Mo, you, you know, you're talking about squad players that might even come in a little bit more this year than what they, you know what didn't last year. Players like Arturo Vidal. I think one thing you could perhaps criticise Conte for, and you can understand why he did it, is he didn't use the squad a whole lot towards the back end of the season. I'd, I'd find during game, you'd have Lukaku playing 90 minutes flat out in the game into a 2 0 up in, and you almost be like, just take him off. you know. But I think Inzaghi would be more inclined to rotate the squad a little bit. And I think it's a different scenario, you know, into a chase and that's good. So it was the first one in a decade and things like that. So, you know, Conte obviously had that on his mind. But mm. um, I, I think as well to echo a bit what Gab said too, I think. Having a manager as well as a little less crazy will help too. It'll help take a little bit of pressure off the players. I'm looking forward to seeing Inzaghi's uh, Intel. I was really encouraged by the manner of the performance. It was a bit more exciting. Uh, I think you mentioned it before, Nima. I think sometimes under context, it's a little bit rigid. You know, it's a little bit sort of, you know, let's just make sure we win this. Whereas Inzaghi has a bit more fluidity to uh, his football. So I, I was really excited. Um, I was impressed with that in Dzeko too. I thought he played really, really well at... I was a bit underwhelmed by the sign. I thought, well, you know, he might be okay as backup, but he impressed me. I think he's in really good shape. You know, the the way he controlled that ball when Brozovic blasted it like a cannon at his legs, I mean, that was pretty impressive. So, you know, that's something that we can perhaps rely on through the season. Mm-hmm. You know, there's experience there too. So, yeah, I, I'm quite hopeful having watched it and, you know, maybe not quite as positive as Mo, but I, <laughs> I am thinking, listening to him, you know. But then again, you are. But then again, you are English as well, and 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 that's 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 what you have to. That's what we have to have the balance, don't we? We need someone to be able to, to to Mo's positivity. We need someone to keep us grounded. Yeah, well, that's it. That, that's all I know. That's all I can go off. I can't go off too much positivity. I've never seen exactly. it, so I don't want to get too exactly. <laughs> No, but um, I I know I I think uh the for me Jeko uh man of the match Vidal, like you said, his attitude. I mean, coming off the bench. I've, I haven't seen him like this in years. I was really well, he impressed. Considered to be a bit done as well, you know. Yeah. The points last year, he looked, you know, to burn mm. the phrase, he looked a bit dusted, didn't he? Yeah. You know, so that was encouraging. Yeah, for sure. Right. Um, let's uh, quickly before we move to Moji Moratti and Frog of the Week, just results and goal scorers. I'm going to go first against Hellas, three nil. Uh, I think Lautaro gets one. I think Satriano gets one. I think Jeko gets one. Mike. What's your predictions and who do you think is going to score? What's your prediction? uh, Who who do you think is going to score and what's your prediction? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go with 2 1. But I I actually watched this, the uh, Sassuolo Hellas game, and actually, I thought Hellas played pretty good for being down a man the entire game. So I know, I know Di Francesco, not the best manager in the world, but they did give Sass uh, a good run on the weekend. So I, I don't think it'll be that much of a pushover, but it'll be obviously really nice to see uh, Lotaro back in the lineup. So so we'll mm-hmm. give it uh, two goals for Lotaro, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll say two one. Okay, Mo. I'm uh, I'm following uh, Michael's uh, lead in that uh, I think it's a Lotaro brace, but I think it's a clean sheet as well. So two nil Lotaro, you know, uh, urinates the Marcus territory. 
he's uh, he's the uh, he's the head uh, he's the head honcho now. Yeah, he is. He really is. Um, well said, uh, Jake. What about you? I hate picking score lines, but I'm keen to point out. Last few times I've been on the pod, I've actually got a couple of correct scores. Yeah, you so, have. You have. You know, let, let's give it a go. Uh, I'm going to say three one. I think Hellas will score. Um, I, I didn't think they were too bad at the weekend. Um, especially when they were down to 10 men from part of that game. I thought they were quite good. But I do agree with what you say about De Francesco. I'm not convinced at all. And I think Inter will be up for it. I think Jekyll will score. I like the idea of Satriano scoring too. I really want him to be good. So, yeah, I'm going to back him. I'm going to say John Oglu gets the other one. Mm. Well, uh, let's move on to the part of the show where we pay tribute, rip the piss out of and criticise someone or something heavily in the world of football, starting with the comical side of it, this week's Frog, which we presented by Mr. Michael Gallo. Oh man, it's gotta be Juve, right? Like, come on, like what a what a mess! Like they go they go up two nothing against Udine, and and you think the game is in control, it's over, and you know Chesney. they lose Buffon, <laughs> yeah, they lose Buffon. You think okay, now we're moving on for Buffon. What the first game back, Chesney literally gave Udine two points because of that idiotic. Uh, First goal, he came out and made a fumble, and then he c- comes out and makes another error by taking the guy down. And then on the, uh, oh my God, on the second goal, what was he thinking? I don't even understand what was going on in his in his head. No. But the thing is, though, that's not that's not even my frog of the week. My frog is, is Ronaldo because you we live in a in a world that has VAR, and you're celebrating goals like it's the World Cup final in the first game of the season. <laughs> you take your shirt off. You get a yellow card, and guess what? Your goal got taken back, and you still got a tie. That's ridiculous. Come it, on, it man. is no, froggy. It is. It is froggy. It's a very froggish thing. I, I thought of that too. Is that, that that him celebrating like he just Jeez. won it, and the, it was. And the longer VAR took, I was like, they're gonna disallow this, aren't they? The longer it goes, the more chances it's, it's yeah. turning around. And guess yeah. what? He knew it too. As soon as as soon as he got his shirt back at the end, he's like, he starts smiling. He knew. He knew, and guess what? That's that's you got to know better, especially in a VAR world. You cannot be acting like that and taking your shirt off until you've got the check done. And guess what? Yeah, you paid your price. That's karma for you, and that's why he's the frog of the week. Absolutely. Let's move on to something much more positive. This week's Morati, which we presented by Mr. Positivity himself, Mr. Mohamed Massa. He's, he works a lot. He's intelligent and. He surprised uh, people sometimes with his uh, ideas. Not easy to find one person of this uh, quality. Uh, once again, I'm blessed with a wide array of things to choose from in a world of uh, positivity, at least in my brain, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> where it's all uh, roses and rainbows. I don't, I don't understand where, where, you, where you guys are getting this negativity. Marcotti is saying we've downgraded everywhere, we're this and that, and Sunim are <laughs> bankrupt. You guys live in an alternate universe. This is uh, <laughs> the, the land of uh, the truth unicorns is somewhere in the middle. The truth yeah. is somewhere in the middle. I'm gonna say. No, but uh, all, all jokes aside, you guys have mentioned a lot of really interesting things. You know, Zeko's performance, Vidal's attitude, uh, uh, Chalonoglu scoring, uh, and 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 getting involved so well on his uh, debut. But for me, for me, there was nothing more positive than seeing. The fans back at the Miyazu, yeah. at the San Siro. There was Amen. absolutely nothing better than this. Uh, playing in the San Siro with no crowds for a year and a half has been abysmal. And the fact that they didn't get to send off uh, the champions or see them off at the, at the stadium in the stands, despite being packed in the tens of thousands outside, which of course is the most ridiculous thing in the world. You know, it's it, it, it broke my heart. But now, at least... The Inter debut at the San Siro as champions in front of a home crowd, albeit a 50% capacity, even less than 50% capacity. But it's, uh, you know, better than nothing. And, and really, football is nothing without the fans. Uh, or, or, or it's, a, it's a, sh- a shell of itself without the fans. So the San Siro with, with a proper crowd in it, with proper ooing and eyeing and screaming and chanting is, is, is the Morocco. Amen. Uh, and... Let's move on to something much more negative. This week's Moji, which will be presented by Mr. Jake Smalley. Oh, 
Now, this one is sort of born out of personal frustration. It relates to a certain tattooed necked Belgian midfielder who's going to play <laughs> in the Belgian Brewery League now with Antwerp. So it's Rajin Yangolan for me this week, who's been in trouble for drink driving. And I just want to take this time to read a statement out to you from his personal spokesman, which I think will make you laugh. So he was caught drink driving just a week after joining the club. So he's had his licence suspended. And this is what his own personal spokesman had to say, Omar Saldi. He added once Raja had been caught. Raja had a free Saturday night and he admits that he and he let himself get carried away by the emotion of the moment. You know, so obviously you go out and drink drive. Uh, he's had a huge <laughs> boost from the warm welcome he's received from lots of his old friends. Again, you know, I'm so happy I've had such a good reception. I'm going to go and drink drive at 150 miles an hour. Uh, he hadn't intended to drive after drinking, but it happened due to specific circumstances. OK, so that, you know, that makes everything OK. So every time I commit any sort of crime or do anything wrong, I'll just say it's down to specific circumstances. Uh, I'm, I'm really disappointed in Raji because when I first started writing for the site, it was around a time where I'd been to watch the derby just after he'd signed. I was really excited. I'm into shirt. I even got Yangle on the back of my shirt and I was, I, was, I was so wanting to be good. And he's just let me down and he's hit a new low for me. So he's Moji of the week. I mean, anyone who's speed, I mean, he's speeding. It's a 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning. He's, he's speeding. That's why he gets pulled over. They do a breathalyzer test and he's over the limit. They suspend his license. It's to me, there is no, I have nothing but contempt and rancid hatred for people who drink and drive. No respect whatsoever. You're an idiot if you do that. Doesn't matter if it's Brozovic, Nangolan, random Joe on the street. Doesn't matter. You just don't do that. Anyway, that's all we have time for this week. I'd like to thank Gab Marcotti. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Gallo. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. And very nice to hear everyone again. Thank you. And Mr. Mohamed Nasa. Woot foot. Always a pleasure. See you guys soon. <laughs> Mr. Jake Smalley. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to have a chat again about Inter again. And let's hope for three more points again this weekend against Hellas. Forza Inter. For sure. And until next week, I'm until next time, I'm your host, Nima Tavale Rutsari, wishing you health, stay safe, stay healthy, listen to your authorities. Uh, three points and sempre e solo forza Inter.